All right, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys briefly about schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. I am not going to go through this whole PowerPoint because a lot of it is information straight from your DSM-5 and um, selecting effective treatments and your uh, psychopharmacology text. I am going to highlight a few things. Um, this full PowerPoint is uploaded to Blackboard, so you have access to the PowerPoint that you can go through and read all the slides individually. Um, so don't feel like I'm rushing you through. So what are psychotic features, right, when you think about this? Um, any client who's experiencing delusions, hallucinations, disorganized thoughts, speech and behavior, uh, negative symptoms are a reduction of behavior. It's actually their, either their speech is blunted or their slowed movements. Um, all of these aspects can be included in a psychotic disorder. So when we first talk about delusions, the thing about a delusion is that it is a fixed belief and it is a belief that sometimes actually can seem like it could be true, right? So someone could be convinced beyond a doubt that their spouse is cheating on them, even if there's there's either conflicting evidence or no evidence to prove it, but yet they're, they have this delusion that they are being cheated on, which in real life could be true and sometimes it is really hard to figure out if someone is actually delusional or not my advisor when I was going through my master's program talked about how he had a client this woman who um, was convinced that people were breaking into her house and messing with her things and they said oh she's delusional well it turned out people actually were breaking into her house and messing with her things she did not live in a good neighborhood um, and so it's just something to keep in mind as well um, so there are all these different types of delusions um, and this is again uh, persecutory is, is you know somebody coming after me uh, referential is when they think um, people out in the world famous people are doing things and it's communication to them um, so for instance if I saw the president scratch his nose that means that I need to be doing a B and C that kind of stuff um, grandiose they think they have exceptional abilities or they're famous um, erotomanic is about relationships they believe someone is in love with them Nihilistic is that something bad is going to happen, it's going to happen soon. Um, somatic is like a preoccupation with their health, they have delusions about their health somehow. Um, and bizarre delusions are ones that are clearly implausible, this definitely wouldn't happen. Okay, hallucinations can be auditory, which is the most common, they can be visual, um, they can be tactile, which means that they could feel like they could feel like somebody's crawling, something's crawling on them, or they can feel it on their skin. Um, the thing with hallucinations, and, and most people think, well, schizophrenia, people hear voices. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes they do hear voices and they hear people talking to them. Other times, um, I had a client with schizoaffective disorder once, and he said that it wasn't that he was hearing things, it was that his thoughts were really loud. Um, and depending, sometimes your client may be aware that they are actually hearing something or other times they may not have insight into it. Um, so another client I had um, didn't have insight into the fact that, that they weren't real and truly thought that um, angels were talking to her. Um, so this can come in a lot of different forms and a lot of different severity. Okay, let's move on here. Um, disorganized thinking, these are some symptoms that you'll see of disorganized thinking. Again, this is, this is all listed in your text, so we'll keep going here. Um, and catatonia, catatonia is when um, the client has some sort of decrease in reactivity to the environment. They either stop moving or they move really slowly. Um, they can not move at all. I had a client once who, um, and this was when I was working in a crisis stabilization unit, I had a client who she would, she would walk around and she would walk around slowly, but then it was like she would get stuck. And so she would stop maybe near the trash can or near a table and then she would be there and we would have to go kind of engage her and get her to keep going and she would be standing there for a long time if we left her and didn't interact with her. Um, all right, negative symptoms. Um, Abolition is a lack of drive or wanting to complete things. Allergy is poverty of speech. Anhedonia is just, I don't, I don't want to do anything. Um, so these are other things that can come up. Here, I mean, again, this is 
you guys, this is straight out of um, your DSM, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just remember when you're looking, and, and this chapter starts on page 87, and so when you're looking at these, make sure that you go through and read the details, right? So if I'm going to diagnose someone with delusional disorder, I have to go through all of these lettered criterion. Um, so this one says there must be the presence of one or more delusions with at least one month's duration, right? So that's something you need to think about when you think about your cases, when you're thinking about clients. How long has this been going on? Does it actually meet criteria? Um, am I ruling this out? Um, and, and, when, and this is very specific because if you're diagnosing delusional disorder, then it's not that hallucinations are prominent um, and that the, in the year sub B that they haven't met uh, criteria for schizophrenia. So delusional disorder is really about the delusions and that is the main um, thing. It's not about actually having hallucinations and that if there are hallucinations involved then you would really want to focus more on schizophrenia. Um, and then here so you see C and D um, looking at different um, mood disorder, mood episodes have occurred concurrently with delusions. Their total duration has been brief relative to the duration of the delusional periods. That is because if Again, if the mood is the prominent thing, then you're going to look at depressive disorder with psychotic symptoms, bipolar one disorder with psychotic symptoms instead. Um, and then again, and this is usually an add-on for a lot of them, is that um, it, you know that it's not due to a medical condition and you know it's not due to them using substances. Again, here are the subtypes. We talked a lot about these. And you can have one or you can just it can just be unspecified. Here are some specifiers again with different episodes whether it's in remission, so this is in the past, but they're doing all right now, whether it's continuous, um, the severity, and um, and the severity, when we're talking about any of our schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders, there's a very specific severity um, checklist that you're going to use to rate the severity. And that's on page 743 in your text. And if you go there and you look, and actually I think I have... Boom. Okay, so if you look at this, you see that you're going to go through all of these different aspects that may or may not be involved in any sort of psychotic disorder, and then you're going to rate them. And then once you've rated them, then you can decide whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. And so I want you guys to use this any time that you think you have a client with a psychotic disorder or you decided you're going to go with a diagnosis of psychotic disorder. I want you guys to use this and refer to it. Now, you don't need to turn it into me. I don't need to see the evidence that, you, that you've done it, but I do want you to use it informally. Um, and, and that way you can use your clinical judgment based on severity of the psychotic symptoms. All right. Um... Make sure when you're thinking about delusional disorder that there could be some cultural issues. There are um, certain cultures that have certain beliefs um, that are normal for them in their in, and in their culture. So you got to be aware of that. And this is there's a big genetic loading with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders that um, if someone in your family has had it, you are more likely um, to get it. It's also interesting because the the age of onset um, is older. So in in men, the age of onset is usually uh, right around between 18 and 20. Um, and then for women, it's a little bit older. It's actually sort of um, early to mid-20s, and I've seen that. I had um, the one client I was telling you guys about with the loud thoughts. His psychotic break was right when he was starting college. It was his freshman year. Um, and then the other client that I was telling you guys about that was talking about angels talking to her, her psychotic break was in her senior year of college. Um, and again, these can be very devastating and sad things. Um, because it because it happens and it's life changing and then the you know the family has to deal with that and they also have to deal with the reality that there's something in the biology of their brain that has changed. All right, again with schizophrenia, again just read through these really carefully um, and see. And so in this one says, you know, they have to have two or more of all of these things that are numbered, um, and at least one of them must be one, two, or three. So again, it's the devil's in the details, you guys. If during a one month period. Um, that you really want to sit down and say, okay, are all these things here? And as I go through these things, because I'm not going to see you guys this week, if you have, if you go through and you have questions, either write them down and ask me when I see you guys on Monday, or just email me and ask me. I'm, I'm happy to help with this stuff. Again, with duration and talking about schizoaffective disorder, you would diagnose schizoaffective disorder if the psychotic symptoms came first and then there was mood disturbance. We'll talk about that. Um, it's more of a, like a which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um... A schizophreniform is when it's it's almost schizophrenia, but it hasn't actually reached the duration. 
Um, and here's where I was talking about with schizoaffective disorder. And so then you would actually, if, if you have evidence that the psychotic symptoms started first and then they started having the mood changes and then you would go in and talk about whether it would be bipolar type or depressive type and talk about the different episodes. Um, and you may or may not have this information. And again, this is why you go back to a provisional, you go back to by report, um, by record, whatever it is, because sometimes it'll take you a while to get to know a client to really figure out what's going on. Okay. Brief psychotic disorder. Um, this is, this is a short duration psychotic disorder. And then again, you have psychotic disorder due to another medical condition. This sometimes happens, I found, when I worked in the hospital, there would be older women who would get urinary tract infections, and for whatever reason, in elderly women, this can cause psychotic symptoms. Um, and then substance-induced psychotic disorder. And this would be one that, um, that the, the client has been using substances, and as a result, they are experiencing hallucinations or delusions. But I guess the key is here is that it's not, they can't have insight into the fact that they've, they've been using and that's what's going on. Okay, catatonia, we talked a little bit about that. Um, and then here it kind of goes through the different drugs. I mean, especially with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, medications are really the first line of treatment. Um, and in, when you're going into counseling with somebody, depending on the severity of um, their symptoms, you may be just looking at behavioral interventions, um, setting up supports for them to function, that kind of thing. Um, if they're if they're experiencing a lot of psychotic symptoms, they're having trouble with their thought processes. Processes, you're not going to be able to do a lot of in-depth talk therapy. But again, all this stuff is in your text, and you can kind of go through and read this on your own and see. Here's what I was talking about. I mean, basically, the objective would be let's help them function on a daily basis, take care of themselves, take their medications, because it can be really difficult to have people take these medications because the medications have really crappy side effects, frankly. Um, you know, it might help, um, you know, make the hallucinations go away or, you know, the delusions go away, but then they might also gain a lot of weight. Um, they might have no libido, you know, I mean, they're just, there are a lot of side effects that they can't experience. And because that, um, because of that, it makes them not want to take the medications or frankly, they say, Hey, I'm not sick anymore. And then they stop taking them. And that was one of the main things, um, working at community mental health and case management was that, um, we had a people that would really, were really sick and we had to find a way to get them to take their medications. And, um, that was what was really helpful. What I really liked is they have, um, shots. They would have a shot where they would come in and they would get a monthly shot and that would be their medication. And that was a lot easier for us to manage, uh, medication compliance. Um, and I think, and I think depending on what's going on with their symptoms and severity, again, so you would have to look at the case. There are some people who need inpatient treatment, at least until the psychotic symptoms are under control. Um, they might need a partial hospitalization for long term. They may need a group home. All these things are things to consider. Um, and it, you know, it just depends on what kind of support system they have and what's going on for them on their prognosis. Um, you know, it was really sad to see some of these clients, the clients I talked about that had been in college and had this break because after that, it was just finding a way for them to have their daily functioning and they weren't really going to be able to do these things that they had set out to do and they needed a lot of support and they needed to be living at home and, um, it can be really sad, but hopefully, you know, they had a lot of support and loving family that were able to take care of them. And again, sometimes that's not the case if you have clients who are homeless, who don't have a lot of support, and so then the prognosis would be poor. All right, I think that's it for this one, guys. Again, if you have any questions, email me.